Ya. What up, what up, yo, yo. What up with everybody, man? What's up with all my people, man? At all out there, man. You know, I got country. I got I got a lot of awesome people who watch me, right? I got the best of both worlds, right? Because I got I got country people. I, I noticed, man, I got a lot of country people that watch my show, man. Shout out to everybody that's out there in the country working hard in the rather in your field, man. You know what I'm saying? Out there and, and providing uh dairy to us, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to everybody out there growing your crops. Whatever it is that you're doing out there in the country on your own land that you own, and I can't tell you nothing on. Yeah, I respect that. I, I, invite me to a, a bonfire. I'll come to a bonfire. You know what I'm saying? I know what time it is at the bonfires. You know what I'm saying? You could do mud fun shit like mud bogging and shit. You know, uh, mud bogging is when y'all like, like, like normally black people wouldn't do nothing like that, right? But you get on the back of this tube and they and they get on, they got a truck and, you, and it's just mud and they it gets like a like you sliding like one of them big inner tubes. And they just run that motherfucking around in a circle. They just doing donuts. You just hanging on that mu- that big tube. It's just it's fun though. I'm telling you, it's hella fun. Like try it. It's hella fun. You get a little bit of country music up in you. You start hearing some tracks that you like. Start learning a little bit more about some country. Um, I like that too. Um, also, yeah, blowing shit up with Tannerite. I love that. Like the Tannerite. Oh my goodness. Like you got to hit it. You got to be on point though. You know what I'm saying? You got to hit the Tannerite and it just blows up shit. Get some old washing machines, some old refrigerators, some old appliances. We go and grab those off the back of the stores or whatever you go grab them from. We go have a couple of those, blow some shit up. <sighs> it's fun as hell. <laughs> it's fun. And the best thing about it is like, you can't get in trouble. No police. You know what I'm saying? So, Hey, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Big fire going, got a nice barbecue, lots of fun going on. People drinking, everybody leaving happy. You know what I'm saying? Hey, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to my city folk too. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to my city folk. You know what I'm saying? Like we, my folk that like going to the club, like going out, having a nice little drink, you know what I'm saying, with no problem. But there probably got to be one or two dudes that always want to try to start something up up in the city. And, and you know what I'm saying? Whether it's a pub, whether it's a tavern, somebody always got to be drunk in the city doing something. That's why I like drinking in the country. It's nice and smooth. But hey, but hey, but uh, not all the time, though. You got to know the right spots, you know what I'm saying? But I don't understand how a lot of y'all dudes be going to the club anyway and wanting to be fighting with each other. And you got all them half naked women standing around you. You know what I'm saying? I don't understand that. But uh, that's another thing, another day. But anyhow, I'm I, I mean I'm, I'm just in a good mood right now because of my Pittsburgh Steelers getting the dub. You know what I'm saying over Washington. Shout out to Washington for the dub, man. That that controversial play to me, I must say that looking like on TV, it looked like he got it. But when they had the replay in the line of game, I think the referee was on point because his knee hit the ground. He really didn't get a full turn in. Um, he he didn't. Uh, they didn't allow him to turn. And where the ball was when when he was down in that crouch position, I think was. A fair spot, but I must say, watching it on TV and that yellow line that was on TV, I thought he had maybe got the first down. And I gotta say that as a Stiller fan, first off, before I get into anything else that I'm talking about, right? Um, I, I but I, I definitely do want to talk about the media. Like the media always like not now they want to get on this Pittsburgh Steelers train. Like man, you should have known from the jump that the Pittsburgh Steelers was going to be on point, bro. Like right? I mean, like. Y'all knew that y'all should have figured out, okay, the Steelers might be a little bit, but nobody even gave them grace. It was third or last place in the division. Like, that's crazy. And everybody's preseason polls, right? And now they're talking about us being Super Bowl contenders. I don't really want to get caught up in too much of that Super Bowl contender thing, but I, I don't see how, if if you're going to say that 
everybody, every team that has a good defense, good to great defense, um, a team that has a, a good to great quarterback and a team that can run the ball and a good coach wins the Super Bowl, you absolutely have to put the Pittsburgh Steelers in that category. Mike Tomlin, regardless of what you want to say about Russell Wilson and what he was doing in Denver, Russell Wilson still top 10 passer. Um, touchdown touchdown to interception ratio was good. Um, uh, he's been taking care of the ball with us very good right now. But when, and I hope that he continues on doing that. And I think the Arthur Smith system tries to minimize quarterback interceptions. I'm trying kind of seeing that. Um, and they're both playing, they both been playing pretty efficient, right? Uh look, when when you get to looking at our defense, some people might say that our defense is great. Some people might say that our defense is good. One thing you're not saying is our defense is average. You can't say that because we're we make plays. We've been making plays, um, and finding ways to win. And that, that's what great teams do, right? So I don't want to get caught up in all that hype, you know what I'm saying, and get my hopes up super high with that. But we got all the tools that's necessary to take is to go as far as we need to go. And I think we're primed for that because a lot of quarterbacks get banged up, right? And we got to protect Russell Wilson better because he's he's up there in age. I do like the escapability. I think he still got a little bit of that left. We seen some flashes of that yesterday in the Washington game when um when he escaped and uh Kelvin Austin got hurt. I haven't looked at an injury report right now as as of this minute making this video. So I don't know uh Calvin Austin's status right now as far as injury, but um I think the offense would should open up a lot more. Uh, Pratt fire move, uh, Darnell Washington. Uh, he he got a he has he they want to use him more, they want to use Darnell Washington a lot more. Russ likes Washington, and Washington is open a lot. A lot of teams is sleeping on him, so he's get he's gonna get the grace of any other receiver. So Darnell Washington has to step up a little bit. I like that we went to fullback with Connor Hayward a couple times. Um, Look, Najee runs the ball great. Najee runs the ball just great. He does just fine. Jalen Warren just got a different punch. That that was a very uncharacteristic fumble what uh, Jalen Warren had in that game. Like it really was. But he's like he's shorter, and shorter running backs are harder to see. So you know, about time you actually see them. They're actually already what two three yards into the play. If they're strong and they could, if they're strong and quick and can make a move like Jalen Warren, that's an extra you know two or three yards. It's why those shorter running backs that's, you know, big and strong like that, 5'9", 225, 215-pound running backs, that's why they they get a lot of yards, you know. And I, I'm, I'm seeing why Jalen Warren is doing his thing. Now, Najee, he, he's uh, agile, athletic and stuff, you know what I'm saying? He does his thing. Jalen Warren came in, gave us a little boost, but he got that fumble. You can't do that. Got to hold that ball. Sometimes it's just best to just go down. Um Normally, but you know, sometimes, especially when Najee's running the ball, he moved that he would have moved that pile into the end zone. So I get why they didn't blow the whistle and why they gave us some grace because they didn't give Najee a lot of grace in the Jets game. Um, when we played the Jets like that, so I get why they didn't blow the whistle to referees and everything. But look, I like the way our team is looking, and from here on out, now we move into the division play, the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, it's, it's respected like you know and then we got on you know, christmas uh christmas day i think we, we playing the cincinnati i mean not cincinnati geez we got the kansas city chiefs but we still got cincinnati we still got cleveland and we still got baltimore to get through right we go on the back half of our schedule is why everybody said we had the toughest schedule in the nfl because they expected the Bengals to be good and i still think the Bengals are a good team i just think the ball just didn't, you know what I mean? It just didn't bounce their way. This shit this, well, you know, that's a basketball term, but hey, it just didn't. Some games just they're right in it. And a lot of games just didn't go their way. You know what I mean? A little, a little bit of luck. They maybe could have used that a little bit. And um, you know, a little bit of turmoil, you know, as far as not having a running back getting hit uh Khalil Herbert a little bit late. I think Herbert is gonna be a problem to deal with. I think the uh Cincinnati Bengals got him right on time. About to move into the you know the back half of their schedule, so we not we don't want to count out Cincinnati because Joe Burrow and um you know Jamar Chase, they're great players and getting Herbert there, a running back where I think that 
he'll he'll cover up a little bit more of what Joe Mixon was able to provide. Letting Joe Mixon go, I think, was a, a horrible mistake, and they they know that too now. That's why they're trying to replace some of his attributes right now with getting two running backs. You know, having uh Brown and having Herbert that should account for Joe Mixon. You know what I'm saying? And both of them put together. You know, what I mean, maybe you can get a little bit of Joe Mixon this out of that. And what he was able to provide for that Bengals team, uh, the Browns, you know, the quarterback situation, man, it's it, it just been that way. Um, I think they overpaid uh, with, with the Sean Watson. Sean Watson got a gruesome injury. Um, it's crazy that it happened that way, but you know, they they got Jameis Winston in there. Um, Jameis Winston had a great first showing, you know, but now. He seems to struggle when teams are prepared for Jameis Winston uh, to the fullest. He seems to struggle and seem to have been some of the same things going on. Um, I, you know, because he look, he come out throw for three hundred in one game, and then in the next game you can't even get two fifty. So, you know, it's like what's going on. The Browns really got to solidify a quarterback. Uh, I don't know if they go with uh, t- Thomas Robinson from UCLA. I don't know if they go with him or not, but um. They got to figure something out over there, man, with the Browns. Uh, they're, they're probably, if, if not, then they'll probably draft a quarterback out of this year's draft. I don't know who the Browns actually go after, but uh, yeah, they definitely got to solidify and get, and get a quarterback there in the Browns. And uh, because they're losing guys, and um, guys are starting to, you know, get very impatient with the organization and, and the moves that they're not making. And that's not good when you got this disgruntled team going on. So I feel for the Cleveland Browns fan, even though I'm a Steeler fan, I still got a lot of friends out there and people that watch that are Browns fans. So look, I understand what y'all going through, man. I know y'all pissed off out there, man. Um, you know, in, in Cleveland and everything goes going on out there, but uh, I ain't mad at it. I ain't mad. And, um, you know, Steeler fan must say, but yeah, I like I like the way that we looking. So put some respect on the AFC North, man, because we still coming. You dig? All right. Now, hey, look, I was on my picks, man. It's crazy because on my picks, y'all, I was literally like, I missed, I missed uh three out of the 10 picks out of the t- t- uh, 13 games. Out of 13 games, I only missed three games. Um, I want to talk a little bit about those games, right? Uh and I'm going to pull them up a little bit because I'll, I'll get them pulled up here. Pull up my extra, you know what I'm saying? Get my thing going. Get my thing going. You dig? Yeah, you get two truck and chubbies. You dig? You know what I'm saying? Get two of us. Nah, but you don't get two. You'll see. You'll see what I'm about to do right quick. You dig? So, you know what I'm saying? Me and Shad both had ran with the, um, we, me and Shad both had messing around and went with the Miami Hurricanes. We know what the Miami Hurricanes had did, man. We know what happened. Um, there was some key moments in that game, man, that that you could take away. A lot of key moments that you could take away about this Miami game that um that I think that I took out of it. Let me get to my notes real quick. You know what I'm saying? Because I got to my game notes, but also it was a good battle. Um, up in like you you like look, man. You knew I don't want to say it was a good battle, but look. From the outside looking in, there's some things that you could take away if you ain't a Miami Hurricanes fan. But if you're a Miami Hurricane fan, you pissed off today, right? But like, let's say for instance, um, so in the so in my in my game notes, I had to go through and watch it and look at my game notes, right? So if I take away from in these Miami games, these are some plays that I thought that was important, right? In the first quarter, um, in the first quarter with 14 minutes and 20 seconds into the game. When uh, it was second and 11 and they allowed Jamal Haynes to bust for that 65 yard run and get down to the Miami 21 and it was a first down. They did stop him. But look, it was a big play like that was a key play. And I think that that gave Georgia Tech some momentum and Miami has been known to get gashed with that run, that run defense and their run fit seemed to be, you know, what I'm saying not consistent at all. You know, what I'm saying so. I, and and I did say, you know, let's I'll take the hover over with Jamal Haynes. And I think he did go over for, for a fact. I mean, it, I think they had what 275 yards total this whole game. So they just really just ran the ball on them the whole game. But I don't think a, a people gave enough credit to Aaron Philo um filling in and, and and being able to make a couple of plays, right? And, and whether it was running or passing, right? But I'll I'll talk about that here in a second. Um 
the, in the first quarter with like 12 minutes to go in the game. It was second and nine, and the Cam Ward, you know what I'm saying, he threw the pass with 74-yard touchdown to Aurora. That bounced, that got them going back, and they was like, that got Miami going crazy. The team, um, I thought they had picked up a little bit of momentum, but then like with 37 seconds left in the first quarter, um, it was 39 on the Miami 41, and my Aaron Fuller, he ran for 12 yards and got a first down, right? You got to get off the field on third down. And and it's like, wow, they keep giving them chance after chance. And that's a 12-yard run, right? And I think that's what my, a lot of Miami Hurricanes fans were talking about as far as getting gashed with the run. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was plays like that at 39, and here they are. You know what I'm saying? And it was on the Miami 41. 39, you got to get off the field or else they may be able to kick a field goal and turn that into points. And they get down to the 29-yard line. Now they ain't field goal range, right? So in the second, so, and then, you know what I'm saying? It was like back and forth, you know, here we go back, back and forth, you know, keep the, the scores pretty still low up until like it was, it was the second quarter with two minutes and 27 seconds. It was fourth and three. Um, it was at the Georgia Tech 23 yard line. Cam Ward threw a pass that was incomplete. Got to complete that. So it's got to complete that pass. We got to complete that pass, Cam. You know what I'm saying? Like, and we all got him as, a Heisman favor, but you got to complete that pass, man. You got to make that play. Um, another play was like it was a third quarter, the third quarter, 11 minutes into the third, like 11 minutes left in the third quarter, roughly around there, like 11 minutes and 15 seconds, something like that. It was four from one. They had uh, the Georgia Tech 39 yard line, Cam Ward, another incomplete pass, four from one. Like, you got to get that. You got to get that, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? That now. That that turns in that that's the difference between being able to either kick the field goal, or you know what I'm saying, like get, at least get in that range. Like you got to make that, but I think you got to be able to run the ball in those situations too, though. You know what I'm saying? So they so right now Georgia Tech is up like ten to fourteen in the game, um, and it's it's the third quarter, six minutes and forty five seconds left to go in the game, in the third quarter. It's 39 at the Miami 15 yard line. Aaron uh Philo threw a complete pass. To, uh, he, he completed a pass for 15 yards for a touchdown. Um, because they're on the Miami 15 yard line. It's 39. They close, they right there in the 15. And Aaron Philo completed a pass to Chase Lane, 15 yard touchdown. They go up 10 to 21 on Miami. Georgia Tech does. Um, so like they was running so much that it was effective little 15 yard pass like you know what i'm saying gotta gotta be able to you know third down get not getting off the field like i said right so then uh the beginning of the fourth quarter fellow he threw a pass complete to bailey stockton for 27 yards uh and he got up to the miami 18 yard line now i think they were they were back on like what at the beginning of the fourth i think they were you know about midfield range or something like that but anyway 27 yards down to the 18-yard line, and it was a first down. Now, at this point, I think the score was like uh, 16 to 21, Georgia Tech or something, but not being able to get off the field and make that move, right? And even still, like, and then then the fourth quarter, it was uh, for, it was six minutes to go in the game, about roughly about that. I think it was like six minutes and five seconds or something like that, if you really want to put it down. But, I, you know, I just rounded it up higher low, you know, tried to anyway. Um was first and 10 at the Georgia Tech 38 yard line. Cam Ward uh completed a pass to Xavier Restrepo for 38 yard touchdown. Um, and at this point, they were already playing from behind and they couldn't start the run, but it wound up being 23 to 28. And that's that's the end of the game right there. And they really couldn't um get the ball back after that. I mean, Georgia Tech being able to run and and that, and them not running enough, I don't think, uh in that game. But look. I think, well, I, I don't want to say that, right? Because we, we'll sit here and say, oh, they might me run the ball enough. And I think so. Um, just about as much as you probably going to get from Miami. I think they ran the ball. They passed 67% of the time. So they ran 33%. I thought that my, if Miami's uh, offense is 60-40, I think you can't stop Miami. You, I think you cannot stop Miami if they're 60-40. Um, I think they're that that's about the pass the run ratio that I would like to see out of the Miami Hurricanes is a 60 40. I don't got no problem with putting the game in Cam Ward's hands, but I would like to see a 60 40. Um, 
you know, saying run pass percentage. And then I think that man me is, the, is at their dangerous and at their best if they're able to do that. Well, Georgia Tech was able to pull it off with only 25% passing and 65% run, which shows like, yes, if you have a, a good run game and you can run the whole game and it's effective, um, you could do whatever. You could do whatever, right? Once you establish the run, I don't care if it's at, if it could be at the professional level, collegiate level, whatever level in football, if you're able to run, then you should be able to do whatever, right? Because now you got to load the box up and now the, load, the passing is open, you know what I'm saying? You get a little, a lot of man to man and everything else. But um, what, I, what I'm not going to do um, as a, and I know Miami Hurricanes fans, a lot of them watch me and I know a lot of them may be frustrated about this loss, but what I'm not going to do is sit here and say that SMU got a chance to win the ACC. What I will say, and I'm and and I'm an outsider looking in on this Miami Hurricanes thing. What I will say is that I do think that Miami was like, like they got to stop spotting people points. Stop spotting people points. Just put your fucking foot on their neck, and and and, and from the beginning, stop playing with people. And I think Miami needed a loss like this um, because. That, like had they got at the cow game, I don't think that they come in this Georgia Tech game and it's even not close. Miami has everything offense and defensively to really put their foot on whoever's neck out here and stomp them. I don't see nobody in the ACC messing with Miami Hurricanes. I watched a lot of football uh, this whole season. Miami Hurricanes have the complete team; they really do. Um, and and to, for people to say that. Sometimes Miami been hurting for that like a uh, loss. Like how could how could we sit here and say that Miami been hurting for a loss? Like we've seen worse things happen in college football. We've seen a lot of these teams and a lot of these games go ways that you don't approve of, right? Um, I don't think Georgia Tech should be sitting where they're sitting right now with what three, four losses. Like there's no way. There's no way the Georgia Tech we've seen put put their foot on neck, you know what I'm saying? against florida state earlier in the beginning of this year is the same georgia tech team that i think that should be a lot better and any georgia tech uh, fan will tell you that that team is supposed to be a lot better than what they are you see how effective they're able to run the ball on miami miami has one or two defense alignment that probably will probably get drafted out of the nfl miami has xavier restrepo which is the best playmaker in college football it, uh, it gotta be in your top three i don't care He's in your top three playmakers in college football, as Xavier Restrepo is. Cam Ward is one uh, A or one B to a lot of people out there when it comes to the best passer in college football. Um, sure, they got some young guys in uh, different places, but Miami could beat you and and with twelve personnel, or whatever. And I think that Miami should have they should have ran the ball a little bit more. I think they might. Then I know it. I know Miami should have ran the ball a little bit more. I think they were a little bit one-dimensional against a Georgia Tech team that is built physically, and I think that that helped out Georgia Tech a lot. They got one-dimensional. I mean, look, 67 passing and 33% running. Run the ball a little bit more. You got big, you got Fletcher Jr., and you got that Martinez. Man, use those backs. They can, they can beat you, bro. They can beat you going heavy, you know what I'm saying, double tight end set, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? 21 personnel set, they can beat you in a 21 personnel set. Miami can do that. Both of their tight ends, McCormick, Arroyo, um, Martinez, or Fletcher in the backfield. And you know what I'm saying? And and would Restrepo and whoever else they want to put on this other side of Restrepo, you know, they can beat you like that. And they can beat you spreading you out. You know what I'm saying? With one tight end and 11 personnel, you know, like I just I think that they needed a game like this. So if you're a Miami Hurricanes fan coming from trucking, you know what I'm saying? Much love to y'all out there. Don't, don't, don't be upset about it, right? Be on, get on your team, you know what I'm saying? Criticize your team fairly. Cool. But I think y'all needed a, a, a take this. Take take it, get a taste of defeat um, and bounce back and come back and, and show the world that the Hurricanes is the best team in college football, period, period. Because it's, it's week in and week out. You could just take somebody's and just snatch it out of there. And I think the Miami Hurricanes could do that, all right? So moving on to the next one. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we we took we took Texas in this game. Uh we we were right on this pick. Me and Shad was right on this pick right here. Um, and I think I think we took Texas for right, everybody else would take Texas, right? Um t- t- Texas is a very well oiled machine. They're a team that another one of those teams I think that can line up and, and they could play 
I think I think they don't want to play big boy football. They like playing a little bit more finesse, and I get it. You know what I'm saying? You got Quinn Ewers, you got you know, you know Manning, Archie back, Arch back there, Jaden Blue. Um, Texas is underrated. Why? Well, I, I think they're, they're. I think people look at Texas as being a lot of finesse team, and and they're not looking at how good that. I don't think people give credit to that that defense that's over at Texas, man. That Texas defense is different, man. And um, and it really, it really is. It's it's a very good defense. I just don't see how Texas has a loss. I just don't know how. I I, I don't see how they can lose that game. But they they got some games coming up where they gotta lose or win. And Texas got it. They got a tough couple games left in this, but I did take them to beat the Florida Gators. Look, the Gators is going through so much right now. I don't think that the Gators, um, they got to get Lagway. They got to have DJ Lagway back there. I don't, I don't think DJ Lagway being in that game will probably made it a lot closer to be honest with y'all. Cause this is a Texas team that a lot of people overlook and that I didn't properly do my homework on like how I should have been throughout the season to really get in a deep in depth look at all of these players. And seeing so when I'm watching the film and I'm watching these condensed highlights of Texas, I'm seeing a lot of good play about it. I'm even on the plays where they're not getting stops and the highlights are against Texas. I'm still seeing this defensive line doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um their gap assignment. And I, I like that because you you want the offensive line to be able to move one way. And I think that they can do that as a whole unit on the defensive line with Texas. Um whether it's crash right, crash left, they can move the offensive line. And when, and when you got a defensive line that could do that, that's where I think that your your best bet is with Texas is to really, honestly, honestly, you got to be able to beat them by passing the ball. I don't think that they're going to allow you to keep running down their throat the whole game. But, hey, we, we've seen things, worse things happen, you know what I'm saying? And college football all through this year, but I did, but we did take Texas to win the game against the Florida Gators, though. Shout out to Texas, man. Shout out to everybody, them Longhorns that like Texas. Um, Shad took, yeah, Shad took um Syracuse in this game, um, because he's he's a huge supporter of Fran Brown, and we took teams that we were supposed to be able to lock in on and make videos about. Like Texas was one of my teams, and I apologize, to everybody out there about Texas, but I get so caught up in that. I, I love college football. I'm too ADHD to really like lock in with one team, right? I, I really am. I, I love my Steelers and I don't even lock in on my Steelers like that, but there is times where I could, I just sit down and I really just start learning more about my team that year with the Steelers because I love them that much. I just became a Texas Longhorn fan by default. You know what I mean? My wife bought me a Texas sign. She's been a Longhorn fan for her whole life. And I'm going to get better with it. I'm going to just get better. And, and I promise I will get better. But uh, but that was one of his teams, though. Syracuse was one of his team. And, I, and that's where I was getting at with this whole thing. Like, so he took Fran and he, so he has kind of a bias when it comes to Syracuse and Fran Brown. But I, I knew that Boston College just presented something different that I don't think that Syracuse was ready for. I think they now they did come ready. Now I don't want to sit here and act like, oh, they got blown out the water. Syracuse just uh they they just straight up destroyed them. No, they that uh Boston College absolutely came to play in the game. Um, I mean Syracuse came to play. They only beat Boston College only beat them by six points, 37 to 31. Boston College, uh, they move up to five and four, two and three in the ACC. Well, three and three now, six and four now. They move up to six and four, excuse me, and three and three. So now they both have the same identical record in the in this uh, season. But I mean, when you look at production wise, though, like Boston College was another another one of them teams that were just able to just run it down their throat. They got they had three hundred and five yards rushing on Miami. You know, what I'm saying? I mean, on excuse. Me. Sorry, Miami fan. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, but I ain't gonna mess up like that no more, though. Anyhow, I probably will, but I ain't gonna take it out anyway. I could clip it, but I'm not. It's just real. Um, yeah, they passed 15 times in the game and they ran the ball 46 times. Boston College did for 75 25 percent. 
They had 65 passing yards the whole entire game Boston College did. They had 305 yards rushing the entire game. Now, when you look at Syracuse, on the other hand, they had passed for 71%, and they had 52 passed passes for 392 yards. That's not a winning recipe, and somehow they still almost won the game. They had 21 rushes for 88 yards, right? They ran the ball 21 times for 88 yards. Now, that's you need about 100, right? You probably need 100 to say that out of the 21 times. If you run a ball 20 times, you probably want to get it like 100 yards to say that it's effective. Shout out the law dog for that. You know what I'm saying? And really looking at that in that kind in that way, in that perspective, right? Um, because Cal McCord was lighting it up, man. Cal McCord was 31 for 48, 343 yards, two touchdowns. Um, no interceptions. He got sacked three times. A Boston College defense was able to get to him three times. Uh, like I said, Robert Show, like I said, when I made the pick, y'all go back and watch the live where well, pick and roll with me and Shad from this week. I told you, Robert Show is a beast, man. He's another one of them running backs out there. I think that people overlook. He had 26 carries, 179 yards, did his thing, to, uh, you know. And then they had also had Jordan McDonald, the one two punch. He had 14 carries for 124 yards and one touchdown. So they were just able to just beat up on them. That offensive line at Boston College is absolutely bonkers. They absolutely did their thing on them. Um, and you got to give it up to those guys, man. Those guys came out there, they balled out. They did what they had to do in that game. But nonetheless, I did take uh, Boston College to win that game. So I, that was another pick that I was right on. Uh, so far, I got two out of the uh, three, you know what I'm saying, right? So we'll keep it moving with that one. And head to the next game. So the next game I had up was uh West Virginia at Cincinnati. Um, the reason why I took I took West Virginia, man, is because well, first of all, I was big on Garrett Green on this offseason. I got to looking into this West Virginia team. They're a very tough team, a very tough resilient team. I think that this is a good program. I think that uh West Virginia had the toughest Big 12 schedule out of all the Big 12 teams, period, point blank. I think that they're they seeing a lot of the top uh talent. And if you don't believe me, you can go look at their schedule. I mean, they had Pitt from the ACC um, early on. They had uh, Penn State early on, um, that which is no excuse. But they played. They had it. They got they Look, coming out Pitt and Penn State back to back. Like, come on, bro. Like, you got the backyard. Like, so first you go at Penn State. Like, that's a rivalry game, low key. You know what I'm saying? When they do play each other, that that got that game got some history. And then you got the backyard brawl. With like, you know what I'm saying, which is Pittsburgh. But how could you say the backyard brawl, Pittsburgh, and then you got Penn State, you know what I'm saying? That's not that's what uh what a two hour, three hour ride from Pittsburgh. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, bro. They they right there. Like they both low key rivalry games to West Virginia and West Virginia fans, right? And that was tough games. Those are very tough games for West Virginia. They come out like that, strong. And I thought they had a very good schedule. So I'm looking at that team like that's a good team. West Virginia is absolutely a good team, but and they wind up beating um, they beat Cincinnati 31 to 24 in that game. And I thought that they played an excellent game, dog. Like I, I really do. Like now, could they play, play better? Yes, but they also had a, a decent balanced game. Um, and vice versa, they had a, a, a decent balanced game plan for Cincinnati, right? Um, and Cincinnati had a decent ball, they had a very balanced game, actually. Cincinnati had the perfect balanced game against West Virginia. It was a good game. And like I told y'all, it would be. Um, Cincinnati had 38 passes for 279 yards. That's 48% of that offense right there when they ran. And then they had 40 uh, rushing yard, 40 rushing attempts for 187 yards, which is 51% of their offense. So, you know, you look at the pass run ratio for Cincinnati was 48-51. 48 pass, 51 run. Hurt. That's like you can't get no more balanced than that, really. Right, right. You got 50 50 down there, right? That's what that is. Um, so they played the perfect balance game for West Virginia. West Virginia came in 60 uh 40. They ran the ball 60% of their offense. They had 26 rushes for 103 yards. They was averaging like four yards per carry. Um, Cincinnati had the higher average, they were averaging almost five yards per carry. Um the passing yards, as far as uh, West Virginia, they were able to pass just enough. They had 17 passes for 156 yards, and that was due to the, the um, Nico Marco, the, the the quarterback who had stepped in. You know, he only threw the ball 15 times. Like I said, that often, and and when I talked about the game, how much was the offensive coordinator at West Virginia going to let Nico 
pass the ball. You know what I mean? How how much were they going to – and I didn't think that they were going to let him take him off the reins and with, with good reason. I mean, he threw a touchdown uh, on, on 15 attempts. He threw a touchdown, but you also threw a pick, and you only had 15, you only had 15 attempts. Like, that's not good. And I think that's why they didn't want to just turn the whole offense over to him and I think that was for good reason. He was also sacked twice. They was able to get to him. Um, Brendan Sorsby, he had he was 25 for 36, 262 yards. He had two touchdowns in the game. He had one interception and he had two sacks. Um, he got to take care of the ball. Like, and he got to do that. You got to do a little bit better than that, taking care of the ball. But uh Brendan Sorsby was the leading rusher in the game. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm sorry, he wasn't the leading rusher, but damn there, I mean. He had 11 carries, 78 yards. He had a touchdown, and he also lost a fumble. Can't do that. He also fumbled in a Colorado game, like turnover central. Fumble, like, come on, man. Like, if Cincinnati could take care of the ball, they win. But Brendan Storsby got another year, and I think that he'll get better. But he should be better next year. Um, Corey Kiner for Cincinnati had 25 carries, 91 yards, and he had also had a touchdown. You know what I'm saying he like he played good. Then uh Evan Pryor also had five catches. He had five catches with five targets, y'all. Had it had a hundred yards and he had a touchdown. Xavier Henderson for Cincinnati had eight catches with it, which is all eight of his targets. Um had 68 yards. That's excellent. Um, and every receiver on their team had, you know what I'm saying, their their, their amount. So if they had four catches, they had four targets, they all got busy. And, and that's something that you got to commend that team for. That's that's huge to do. That's not easy to do. Every time somebody, the quarterback throwing a ball at you, you're coming down with the ball, that's great. Like I said, Cincinnati only passed me. Uh, West Virginia only passed the ball five times. Um, C.J. Donaldson in the game, he had four carries with 12 yards. That that production was horrible. Got to get better with that. Um, Jaheim White had 13 carries for 64 yards. Um he got to get that, that production has to get better out of those two. I expect a lot more from Jaheim White and CJ Donaldson. But uh, Nico, the backup quarterback, had seven carries, 28 yards, and he also ran one in for a touchdown. Now, it, it, that that production has to get better. But other than that, man, like since then, I thought I thought that that defense really showed up for West Virginia, and I knew that they would be the difference, man. Um, I felt like they would be the difference, honestly. But I, I talked about it, you know, and the game and we picked the picks was right on that pick also and why I picked them. And that's why, and we can move on to the next one, Georgia versus Ole Miss. Why did I take Ole Miss? Cause I picked Ole Miss to win the SEC at the beginning of this year before, before the preseason, the preseason started. I took West Virginia to win it all in the SEC. I mean, uh, not West Virginia. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Y'all Ole Miss. It took them to win. It took Ole Miss to win the SEC, and I, I and this and, and this is a preseason pick that I, I picked them before the season had started. And my reason of taking them was simply because of all the off sea of the uh, transfer portal acquisitions acquisitions that they got. I mean, I mean, like Walter Nolan being able to get the number one defense alignment and. Damn near, they say he w- could be the best defense lineman in the country. And then getting Prince Jume Melin from Florida was with their, he was their best edge rusher, period, point blank. Um, I don't know how the hell they let him get up out of the building. Um, Florida, you know, they they, they should have probably tried to lock him down, but I guess he was ready to leave. Um, he didn't see the team, but for whatever reason, you know what I'm saying, he, he got up out of there. But I thought that him getting him, Chris, uh, Paul Jr., Chris Jess, Chris Paul, the basketball player. His son is a middle linebacker at Ole Miss, and he is one of the best middle linebackers in the country. Um, not saying that he is the best, but yes, he's amongst the best. Now, now eliteness, no, no, no. So I would put him in that good category right now. He's a good middle linebacker in college football. Uh, you got your goods, you got your greats, and then you got your elites, right? He's in that good category right now. He can move up. Um, I think that he I don't know if he got another year or not. So don't, don't correct me if I'm wrong or, or you can fact check that or whatever. But don't don't quote me on that. But I think he's a good middle linebacker. And I thought that that defense had all the moves that he had make and then getting Wells from South Carolina at receiver. I thought that would help that receiving core. And he has somewhat. But um, nonetheless, man, Jackson Dart being there and that, that defense, they showed up. Prince Hume Melin was a big reason why Georgia could not do anything with them. Um, look, Georgia, they, they, they 
almost got over 100. They had 99 yards. They had 99 yards. They had 28. They had 28 rushing attempts, 99 yards. That was 44% of Georgia's offense, right? When you get when you're thinking about that. And then they had 36 passes. He dropped back 36 times, had 186 yards. That was 50, 56% of their offense. Very balanced game from both teams, from both teams. Ole Miss had 29 passes, 263 yards was 45% of their offense, and they had 35 rushes for 138 yards and 55% of their offense. This was, a, believe it or not, it looked, they just dominated them. Ole Miss just dominated them. They did. Ole Miss really dominated Georgia. From the, I mean, it was to, the score was 28 to 10. It, it really didn't look close at all. Um, it's not as, as close with the stats are telling you, right? Um, it really, it really wasn't. They were, they weren't able to get the get the offense going a lot. Um, shout out to Austin Simmons, man, came in. Uh, the young quarterback from Ole Miss, man, came down and when Jackson Dart went down early, he came in and and lit it on fire. Went five for six. Uh, had sixty four yards. Very efficient on that drive. That drive was very important to that game. Uh. Who knows what, what may happen, but a backup quarterback coming in and being able to do that to Georgia defense um, was crazy. And I, I also took Ole Miss because I I, I don't I didn't the beginning of the preseason. Shad and I, we we, we talked all the whole entire offseason about and we, we followed the transfer portal, the transfer players uh, as best as we could to our abilities and looking at all of those transfer players and players moving around. I knew that college football was headed in this direction of what we're seeing right now. So that's why I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of it. Like, cause, cause I kind of, I seen it, I seen this going on and I knew that the way that the SEC had recruited and the way that they brought players in from wherever they got them from, because there's something with the SEC. If you cannot get a transfer player from the, from an SEC school. So they have to come from outside of the conference, right. In the SEC. You know, you can't uh, – Kentucky transfer cannot go to Georgia and play. They're not having that no more, right? Like, you feel me? Like, they're they they they're, they're trying to stay away from that, trying to have, build some kind of honor code amongst each other um, so that they're not tampering with each other. But I don't know how long that's going to last, but I think that that's an effect right now. Um, but, look, they, the players that they had, God, I knew it was going to step up. But let me stop rambling and get on to a little bit of these stats real quick. Carson Beck was a 20 for 31. He had 146 yards. He didn't have no touchdowns. Had a five, he had a, had an interception, turned the ball over, and he got sacked five times in the game. Um, can't be that way. You can't. You can't. He, he only met. He had 11 misses, right, out of 31 attempts. Um, that's not good. And as of late, when pressure is on, you're not looking good. And that's why quarterbacks like Cam Ward and Shador Sanders, and I'll get to them later. I'll get I'll get to I'll get to Shador later, but that's why people think should the, the world of Shador Sanders because every co- college quarterback that seems to get a little pressure underneath them, they panic, they throw picks, um, and they lose games where they get sacked five times. You can sack Shador five times. He probably could throw a pick, and Colorado still probably will beat you, and he still make up for it with his drives and his, his accuracy. That's why, and his toughness, he's different, Um, by the way. Anyway, Jackson Dart, he was uh 13 for 22, 193 yards, one touchdown, one interception. He only was eight, sacked one time, so that offensive line stepped up. And a lot of people thought that this Georgia defensive line was going to just run through them. And I, I just didn't think so. I didn't think it was going to happen like that. Uh, wind up being the total opposite of that way. Um, when you look at who was able to run the ball, man, I mean, they, they was just trying to get it from everywhere. Jackson Dart had carried it seven times, 56 yards. Um, Dominique Thomas had nine carries, 21, 24 yards. Uh, you, 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 you sell this Bentley had 13 carries for 28 yards. Uh, Georgia just they just couldn't run the ball. Period. None of their backs was really running the ball neither. And uh, but Nate Nate Frazier had twelve carries, forty seven yards, and a touchdown. Um, Trevor Etienne had six carries, twenty four yards. He probably should have stayed down there. I, I you know, I guess he's trying to work on his pass block and for the next level. I guess. Um, I you know I I don't know. Don't don't put words in my mouth, but I don't know. 
But getting uh Antoine Wells from over some for South Carolina, he had five targets. He only had three catches for 27 yards, but he did have a touchdown in this game. Um, and like I said, getting somebody like him veteranized was was pretty good. They're they're they they did it, they did the damn thing, man. They did the damn thing. Jordan uh Jordan Watkins had four catches in that game for 68 yards. He didn't have a touchdown. Caden Lee was the man. He had four catches, 81 yards in that game. Like he was he was untamed in that game. That this game right here with Georgia and Ole Miss, man, I was able to pick it. I was like I said, it was already a bias for me a little bit because I took Ole Miss to win the SEC. But um, I'm not hanging my head on either one of these guys because, like, like how we also said in the SEC, one loss is no losses, two losses is one loss. That's how good that con that's how good that league is. The SEC is so good that. A two-loss team in the SEC is uh is just one loss. A one-loss team in the SEC is no loss. It's somewhere else. So, like I said, um, I even made the argument earlier this year, and a lot of people called me crazy for saying that. Um, it it was it was used for the Florida Gators, and I we it was said that if the Florida Gators were to go nine and three, an SEC team would they go in the playoffs? Um, hey y'all, we may see a nine and three team make a squeeze up in there. I'm just saying. The brands are too big, and if you're going to say, if we're, if we're using that same reference and saying that three losses is two losses and two losses is one loss, one loss is no loss in the SEC and how good that division is, then I guess that you may probably see that. I, I wouldn't put it past anybody in the committee to do that, especially if it's uh, one of those top teams like uh, Georgia, for example. If Georgia was to lose another game, um, do they knock them out? Uh, Tennessee, Texas. A and um, and I don't know. We'll see. Especially say that they're, you know, they, they, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Good, good conversation. Probably have it later with the panel. But anyway, another one, another game right here. Indiana. We both took Indiana to win this game right here, and that's largely because of Kurt Signetti. We call him, we call him Kurt, uh, Psycho Signetti. That's what we call him. That's what we call him. Um, a, he come in. And I knew that this was going to be a tough game for for them. This is the best defense that I knew that, that they had faced all year. So, and and I and I and I said that in my take. But Indiana is a decent, balanced team. Now they weren't able to run the ball all over the yard with Michigan, although they were still averaging almost four yards a carry, three point four, like you know, what I'm saying something like that. But they ever getting three yards a pop, Michigan. They ran the ball 34 times for 69 yards, and they were only getting two yards of carry on Indiana. So a lot of people think that that run was working, and in some places it did work, but they were only averaging two yards. They ran 52 percent of the time on the offense. Now 30, now dropping back 31 times with the quarterback that they got getting 131 yards from Michigan. I don't think that was a good recipe, but still, like Indiana, still that defense did show up against a good like. If we could say Michigan is good at doing one thing, damn, they're great at doing it, and it's running the ball, right, right. So they did. They they came there and did what they were supposed to do: stop Michigan from running the ball. And look, both teams. It, 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 this was the best defense that Indiana was going to face, and I think that it was a good test for Indiana. Um, and I still do think that they got a chance at the to upset Ohio State. But people want to say admit it or not, I still think and I got Ohio State winning the Big Ten. But yes, I do think that its Indiana team is built up for the challenge. Thirty two passes, thirty two passing attempts for two hundred and six yards. Indiana was fifty seven percent of their offense was that just passing, and then they ran the ball twenty four times for seventy six yards, or for that's forty three percent of their offense. Michigan um, pass percentage was. 48%, uh, 50, 48% pass, 52% run in that game. I don't think that that I don't think Davis Warren should have threw 31 times at all. Um may, may, but like I said, the run just wasn't there as much as everybody thought it was, as it looked. It just wasn't there, man. It really I, they, they were doing a good job. It, it was there at like I don't think you were going to beat Indiana. I think that by just running the ball like that, like they had to get some kind of production out of that passing game. And I, and they did, and they did for the most part. Um, Curtis Rourke, he threw an interception, turned the ball over on him. He, he was 17 for 28, 174 yards, two touchdowns, one pick. Um, 
Tyson Lott, and he he had a decent game, 12 carries, 55 yards. Uh, Donovan Edwards had 50, 15 carries, 46 yards. Um, him, him and uh, Mullins had 10 carries, 30 yards, and touchdown. So he was averaging three yards uh, per per jump. And may, maybe maybe they could have just going back and forth with that. But Miami just – I mean, not Miami. Indiana just got so, – they got so much, man. They got Keyshawn Williams, uh, a, a receiver, man. He has 70 yards this game. You don't know who's going to show up for them. Omar, Omar Cooper, 53 yards and a touchdown receiving uh elijah Sharat, i would probably say he's like the best I, I, you know I, and it's hard to say because you got elijah Sharat, omar cooper miles price uh Keyshawn williams they got a team they have a team they got a decent quarterback they have great coaching and they, they got all the recipe man to take it all the way man so i i don't want to count out indiana man for 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 running the table bro and i i want to see what they do play against like ohio state um, because even if they lose to Ohio State this late in the season and at this point, I don't think that you knock Indiana out of the playoffs, man. I just don't think so, man. Especially how they hold up and how is the loss? How is this loss versus Ohio State if they lose? If they lose against Ohio State, what does it look like? What does the loss look like? Is it is it a field goal? Is it is it a one point? It, you know what I mean? What is it? Because this team is very well coached. They're very disciplined. And I think that we'll, we'll, we'll see that on the field. And y'all will get a chance to witness what I'm saying. And I'm not just blowing smoke. All right. Colorado at Texas Tech. We all seen this game play out the way that it played out, man. Like, I mean, it, it ain't no secret. I mean, look, y'all, we, we we seen we seen Colorado come in and, and, and absolutely just ball out, man. We seen we seen Colorado come in there and ball out like that. That's what we seen out of Colorado. Um, Texas Tech came in, came out strong, guns blazing, crowd throwing tortillas, making tacos, threw taco dip. They threw the the taco mix on the field, threw some salsa on there. They they threw bottles. They you know what I mean they did everything they could do to try to distract this Colorado team from from winning right and. I, I'm just I'm I'm extremely proud to see that Colorado has done a lot of what I thought they should do right uh, to win games and not on you you they have to run enough to just for you to respect the run right and they ran the ball 24 times for 81 yards so no it wasn't over 100 but it was uh, it was effective enough for Texas Tech um not being able to account and then just let Shador do what he did. I mean, should he dropped back 45 times, 281 yards. Uh, that was 65% of their offense. Colorado had a 65-35 split, 65% pass, 35% run. That's not bad for Colorado at all. Um, They kind of got one-dimensional, and I don't think that moving forward, I don't think, and, and I'm going to be honest, like, I don't think that they can be that one dimensional with the teams that these teams who they're about to face now, like Utah, um, that defensive line is absolutely going to get after them, but that's next week. I'm talking about, I'm recapping uh, week 11, right? When I recap week 12, we're talking week 12, I'm recapping week 11 right now. Um, and Texas Tech, you know, they, they, they passed the ball 46 times for 275 yards, 53% of their offense. They had 39 rushes for 169 yards for uh 45% of their offense. Um, and this look, stats can't they, they they don't tell the whole game. You guys actually gotta watch the film and see what's going on and in the game or whatnot. Uh Shador was 29 for 42. He threw he passed the ball 42 times in this game. Um that's normally not good for Colorado uh, in, in past history, him throwing the ball 42 times. That's how you know this team has improved because he dropped back 42 times and they still won um, by double digits, I must add. So he was 29-42, 260 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, and he was sacked three times in his game. They got to him three times. For a team who a lot of people were saying that they wouldn't get there, not me, not myself, but I knew that would happen. Um, Texas Tech gave up six sacks, which I knew that was going to happen. Colorado's defensive line has improved. Um, these guys get after the quarterback, B.J. Green, 
uh lots of them everybody get after them they they get after them but bj green is an absolute monster right brent morton had uh, 20, 24 for 39 219 yards two touchdowns an interception and then sacked six times just a horrible game bro just uh like i mean they they let Colorado climb back in this game because they must have ran uh, that same. They must have ran an inside zone. Uh, Texas Tech must have ran an inside zone like I don't know what twenty six times. <laughs> I mean, I oh my goodness, man. Um, out of the thirty nine times, no, out of the thirty nine times that they ran the ball, they probably ran that inside zone at like. 35 of the 39 times um it's almost like at so 31 no 31 times let's let's see what it is every time they gave Taj Brooks the brawl it was like inside zone and he's got he got 31 carries 137 yards and a touchdown he was averaging four yards a pop y'all still still was averaging four yards and it didn't even look like that it looked like Colorado did a very good job with him he was averaging four yards, and I think that they just stopped him at when they were supposed to, right? I think they stopped him when they were supposed to. I thought that uh, Jalen Connors should have been uh, in that offense a lot earlier. They didn't. They didn't get him going. They got uh, Josh Kelly going a little bit. He had a, over 100. Uh, Coy Eakin, he, they didn't get him going. Uh, Colorado did a good job with him. Like I thought they would, and I and I thought this team's matched up pretty good. Like like it was like a mirror match almost, right? I thought this game was like a mirror match as far as both of these teams, because when you get to looking at it, these receivers for Colorado had a very very even team. I mean, you get Lejonte Rester eighty two yards and a touchdown, uh, Will Shepard seventy nine yards and a touchdown, um, Travis Hunter eighty nine yards and a touchdown, like. You gotta, you gotta love, you gotta love when you hear that stuff like that. I, I think Jimmy Horn Jr. Was, was 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 I don't know if he heard or not. Um, I I, I gotta check up on that. But look, man, it, the Colorado got a, a nice passing attack, and I knew that they would win this game because I thought, and I thought that they would win this game even though they were evenly matched up. But I thought I figured that Colorado's defensive line is a lot more improved than what Texas Tech was, and if and Texas Tech was not going to be able to keep up with Colorado scoring. Um, that's what I figured. And I, I my it wasn't totally on point, but I did take Colorado to win this game nonetheless. And we were right on that pick also. So we'll keep it moving to the next one. South Carolina and Vanderbilt. Now, South Carolina, this this South Carolina team, like I like I always say, and I'm gonna stand on that hill, and I'm gonna stand on that to the end of the day. Or the most consistent defense in the SEC. If you ask me right now, them sitting with their uh, air quote two losses in the SEC. No, they actually have three, right? But if we're saying three losses is two, and two losses is one in the SEC going off of that same thing and them being able to dominate and fashion this Vanderbilt team, which nobody else was able to do yet so far. We've seen Vanderbilt take on some heavy hitters like Alabama. We've seen them take on, we've seen them take on Alabama within Alabama. We'll get to them in a second. We've seen them take on Kentucky. We've seen them take on the other teams and, and nobody was able to just clearly dominate them in the win the way that South Carolina was. That's because South Carolina has the most consistent defense in the SEC. And if you're not rocking with me and if you're not on that narrative now, you might want to get on that train because it has not left the station just yet. But I'm telling you, if we see some more things shake up in a way that and, and remotely, we've seen a lot of crazy things. So anything can happen in college football. But to say if, if South Carolina sneaks in there, this is a defense you do not want to play you do not want to play this team right now you do not want to play us this south carolina team right now i don't care who you are i don't care who you got you don't want to play them right now that defense is 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 incredible uh lenore sellers has finally came in a stride finally got that office going the way that it's going um and they 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 almost played a, a decent balanced game but they didn't need they they were able to run the ball on vanderbilt like crazy right they had 43 rushers for 216 yards. It was averaging five yards per play. Five yards per play, 68% of their offense. 
They passed the ball 20 times for 238 yards, 32% of their offense. Very effective. Very effective. And that's what you want to see out of that team. That's very effective. I, I could run if I could run a ball on if I could throw the ball 20 times and get 238 yards, that's a damn good game, man. To me. Um, Vanderbilt, they passed 33 times for 56% of their offense at 166 yards. They had 26 rushes for 118, 44% of their offense. But South Carolina, that uh, damn ton, that defense, man, a D. Um, and it could, because when you look look at what Lenore Sellers was able to do, man, listen, he took care of the ball. Listen, 14 for 20, 238 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Can't beat that, dog. And they kept him cleaning up, right? Uh, Diego P P P Piva for Vanderbilt, he was 16 for 31, 156 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions, and he was sacked two times. South Carolina, South Carolina kept their quarterback clean. Raheem uh, Sanders, 15 carries for South Carolina, 126 yards, two touchdowns. Got to love that. Diego Piva, uh, Diego Piva was the leading rusher for Vanderbilt, 11 carries, 75 yards, and a touchdown. You cannot have that can't happen for for vanderbilt in the way that vanderbilt want to get busy right but look man nonetheless man south carolina was running a the ball they ran it with lenore sellers uh oscar out of there he he touched the ball uh robbie ashford touched the ball juju mcdowell touched the ball they had various guys that in this game touched the ball that ran the ball um in the ring game and that's all you want to see at, out of Lenore, out of Lenore Sellers is him spread the ball around to Joshua Simon, Nick Carber. Um, Joshua Simon, he, he had three catches, 40 yards and a touchdown in his game on the South Carolina side. Nick Carber had three catches for 43 yards. Raheem Sanders, he was able to, you know, he was able when he had two catches uh, for 52 yards and he had a touchdown like. So that that short dink and dunk game, that that lineup, big boy, 12 personnel, you know what I'm saying? Let's line up in this 12 personnel and, 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 and just pound around these boys. You know what I'm saying? Let, let's let's get it. You know what I'm saying? Let's get it, you know. And and, and that's what they're doing. Like let's just line up in this twelve personnel and, and just run around, run down their throat. You know, look like they want to be in the eleven. Uh, well, well, let me let me be a little bit more clear when I say twelve personnel. One tight end on each side of the line. Um, in the formation, just basic, straight up single back, man. And and they just pound. And they just getting it. They just getting at you after you. And and I like that about that South Carolina team. They're very physical and that defense match it. That offense match that defense energy. Next game on the slot. Alabama and LSU. Yeah, I took Alabama in this game. Um, I'm 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 not off that Alabama thing, man. Um Kellen Kellen DeBoer has to fill shoes like that nobody else really got to cover out there, man. Like, I mean, like for like let's just be keeping a buck, like, like. He Kellen Kellen DeBoer has to go and try to fill somebody's shoes who is a great coach. He's gonna go down the Hall of Fame. He's gonna be known for decades and decades ago. You know what I mean? Like Nick Saban is was a very good coach, man. Very good coach, historic coach, and him coming in there and filling the shoes and having to do that. He's going to be criticized like no other. Like. Any loss to Alabama, you know, the losses that they took, oh, they had Nick Saban went and took that loss. But, you know, Vanderbilt has shown and proved that this year they are the, the Cinder, the air quote Cinderella team of the SEC. But I just think that the parity in college football and getting people in the SEC, no matter who they're for, you being the SEC team was going to be able to jump up and it was going to be able to work out the way that it was, right? Period, point blank. It, it, like, you can't, excuse me. You can't knock any. You can't knock any of those. I, I had a, I had a call. I had to do that, but I'm so real that I, I I'm not going to edit that out neither. But you can't you can't sit there and say that Nick say like like that this team or that any team in the SEC can't get talent there to play. Yes, you get a chance to play against the best. I'm gonna go to the SEC and play. And a lot of a lot of guys want to do that. And now that you could do that with this transfer portal thing, I don't see how. 
any teams in the SEC can be bad, man. If you got a chance to play for the SEC in that league or go to the Big Ten, man, that you got to jump at that opportunity. You have to jump at that opportunity. Those are the two top leagues in college football as of right now. You know what I mean? As of right now, I think that everybody uh, even out, but they, the name of it, the logo, the SEC logo, the Big Ten logo, of the the Big Twelve and the ACC, they're 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 inching that way. They're inching that way, but we'll see how that ends up. Um, but yeah, man, they, they took care of business and they beat them in, in great fashion, forty two to thirteen. Man, they they aired on aired on them. That I think that that was going to happen. Absolutely, I did not figure that Alabama was going to dog them out like that. I did not think that Alabama was going to dog them out. Now a lot of people talk about how much of you know um. They they look they just simply just ran the ball. They didn't they just ran the ball. That's what we're seeing a lot in a lot of these games, right? A lot of these games, they are just running the ball, which goes to show y'all that how important the run game really is, and it still is in football. Like you can, it, it's nice to try to build something to depend that to defend the the seven on seven, you know, uh, football way that people think that's being played now but running a ball is a physical team and sometimes when you just gotta out physical somebody man you just gotta get y'all get an out physical man that's exactly what alabama was able to do man they had four they rushed the ball 48 times 73 percent of their offense for 311 yards they had 18 passes in that game for 109 yards lsu gus nussmeyer 44 passes for 239 yards 22 rushes for 123 yards. Yeah, their running was effective, but you don't, man, listen, man, if you're going to drop that, and, and, and shout out to LSU's offensive line did a decent job. Um, he, Gus Nussmeyer was sacked two times, but he was under pressure a lot. They was getting at him, and, he, and that's effective, right? Because he got two interceptions to go with that. 27 attempt, uh, 27 completions, 42 attempts for Gus, Gus Nuss, Garrett Nussmeyer. <laughs> and it, it, look, he had a touchdown, two interceptions. He was sacked two times in that game. And look, man, when when, when you doing that, you got to say, look, man, man what, what, what's what's going on here? What is going on? And also, their quarterback was he had uh, Caden Durham, eight carries, sixty three yards. Uh, Garrett Nussmeyer had four carries for twenty seven yards in that game. But Jalen Merrow, he had 12 carries for 185 yards and four touchdowns. Like Ryan Williams had one carry for 22 yards. Richard Young had six carries for 27 yards. Justice Hayes had eight carries for 23 yards and a touchdown. Man, they ran the ball. They ran the ball. They ran the ball. That's what they did, man. They ran the ball. Jalen Merrow was 12, 12 for 18 in this game. Everybody like, like fuck, we just going to have a, a, a running attack. We just going to use our big boys. And we're gonna let y'all go eat today. We're gonna let y'all big boys go eat. We put it on, they put it on their offensive line, and that's exactly how they got the job done. However, they got it done, they got the job done. And that a win is a win. And that and that in that dominant fashion like that, man. Oh man, shout out to them for the win. Shout out to Alabama, man. <clears throat> man, Penn State, man. Washington at Penn State. Washington at Penn State. Did I like I I seen this coming, dog? Um, a lot of people in in, in the national media say, oh, well, Washington got the defense that's going to be able to neutralize Penn State's offense. And you know, Penn State's offense, they go off of the Tyler Warren, they go off of Warren so much, they use them in so much ways, and blah blah blah, blah blah whoop de boop. And I'm like, listen, man. Um, I've been watching this team, and um, if, if Penn State, if this Penn State that showed up, sometimes they say a loss is the best thing that can happen to a team at some time, at some sometimes, right? And that's what it looks like with this Penn State team because this team was balanced as ever. This was a very good balanced game from Penn State. They had thirty passes for two hundred and twenty yards. They had thirty nine rushes. For 254 yards. They they're passing. They had they passed 43% of the time in the game and they ran 57% of the time. That is a very good Penn State. And that is what Penn State is. That was a very well coached Penn State game. Now, 
on Washington's end, you just don't get no better with going 50-50. They, they went 50-50 in this game. They had 20, uh, 28 passes and 28 rushes. Um, you don't get that, that's a damn good game from them. It, it, they well, Penn State's defense just didn't allow them to score. And, you know, because they were getting four yards a carry from rushing. I'm averaging that, but it just didn't look like that. They, they were stopping them at the times they needed to in the offense. Uh, they had 119 passing yards. Now, Will Rogers, uh, you know, had what he was uh, 10 for 13, 47 yards, and he had an interception. Uh, but that uh, DeMond, DeMond Williams, he was 6 for 10, 33 yards in that game. He came in, had some plays. Uh, Drew Aller. He has to play like that, man. He, he man, he can dog. Listen, he got to play like that, bro. He got to. He got to play like that. He was twenty for twenty-eight y'all, two hundred twenty yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, and they kept him clean. Like he got to play like that, bro. Tyler Warren had three yards. I mean, three carries for seven yards. Nick Singleton had seven carries for forty-five yards. Um, Katron Allen had nineteen carries, eighty-six yards, and a touchdown. Uh, Corey Smith had five carries for 95 yards, and uh, that that was huge on that on their end. But also getting the help that they needed, bro. Like I was saying, man, like they they got help around Warren, bro. They got help from out of Tyler Warren. They got uh, Liam Clifford got in on the action. He had a catch for 20 yards. Julian Fleming, I've been waiting to hear his name. He had two targets, and he had both caught both of them, and he had 19 yards and a touchdown. Um, I've been waiting to hear his name a lot more. Harrison Wallace had five catches for 50, uh, for 84 yards. Katron Allen, he had a catch for eight yards. Nick Singleton had three uh, catches for 14 yards. Like, you got to be able to spread that ball around, get that dink and dunk game going for Penn State. I don't care if it's downfield, but you got to open up that offense more because Tyler Warren is an absolute Swiss Army knife for that offense. But getting that offense and going more and more, it, that's where it's at. But, um, they look Washington just couldn't find they just couldn't find that their run game you know what I mean they couldn't find it Jonah Coleman was only getting two yards of carry 11 carries 24 yards um Adam Muhammad he couldn't get it going neither eight carries for 20 yards averaging two yards of carry um look Desmond Williams he had seven carries 65 yards uh, so but he's also the quarterback right so the, you know saying dual threat so they just really couldn't get it going. I mean, Dizel Boston, two catches for 35 yards. Penn State did a good job against them, man. And I, as I thought they would, shout out to Penn State. Penn State's baller. Looking like looking like a true playoff team, man. May I, may I add? Looking like a true playoff team up out there, balling the way they are. And this is a game that I was wrong on. Um, I, 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 I you know, I think I took and I and I said I was gonna take them um. Shout out to the Raw fan, Raw Hot family, and everything. Uh, Bishop, I ain't seen Bishop in a while, but uh, yeah, he's an Oklahoma fan, right? But I'm I'm looking at this team, Jackson Arno, and it, it was a very, very good game, man. Um, but the same things is happening with Oklahoma, and then he Jackson Jackson Arnold just can't get out of his way, man. Can't take care of the ball when he needs to take care of the ball. Is why he lost his job. Let me call it what it is. He like he has to take care of it, but he hasn't been able to do that, and that's largely why Missouri was able to win this game. I think that Oklahoma absolutely has the defense, man. They have the defense, and when you got everything in the defense, and when you got all the pressure sitting on some of these guys' back, sometimes some of these guys can't handle the pressure. And I and look, and and that's a real thing, y'all. Like that, that's a tremendous amount of pressure that we would never understand. It's easy for us as fans to sit here and say that, oh, it's football. But that pressure of knowing that I am the end all, be all for my team's success. Sometimes people can't carry that, and you gotta, and you have to have the right support system around in order for him to succeed the way that he needs to succeed, or else. You're or else you're gonna get some horrible things from him, man. Like you're gonna get horrible play out of Jackson Arnold, bro. You're not gonna get his best if it is to his support system. Look, he was 15 for 24, 64 yards, man. No touchdowns, man. No interceptions neither. Sacked two times. 
But like, where's the production coming from from that team? Like, I mean, they they got they got the receivers. Uh, you can't you can't you cannot say that they don't got the receivers. They absolutely got the receivers. Uh, but Bo Sharp, Xavier Johnson, uh, Tatum. Who who else they got? Um, oh yeah, Dion Burke. Let's don't forget about Burks, Brennan Thompson. Like they got they got guys who 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 can catch the ball at Oklahoma. They got the guys right. Um, they got the running back that they got backs that that can take some of the pressure off them. I guess I guess you could say you could try to blame it on the offensive line, but I mean let's just be real. They had three different guys drop back and in a game. And they only had two sacks let up. Not not to say that that tells the whole thing, but the pressure was there. But I mean, look, shout out to the to, to Missouri man, uh, Drew Pine, backup quarterback, came in there. I wasn't sure if they were he was going to be able to uh, roll out offense, but he was. He he got the offense going. He was fourteen for twenty seven in the game, hundred thirty five yards, three touchdowns, and he was sacked three times. And the game was just really just sloppy back and forth. Uh, Luther Burton has not. Uh, I'm just keeping it buck, man. He just has not been what I expected him to be. There, sharing with a lot of other people, expected him to be um at the top of uh stat wise. But I mean, in games, some games he seems to show up, and a lot he hasn't. And I will say that. But look, you know, Oklahoma they had 28 passes, 45 percent of their offense, 135 yards, 33 rushes, 53 percent of their offense, 153 yards. Um, so that, that was a very balanced game from both teams. Um, passing wise, well, Missouri drew pine, they let them throw 30 times, 143 yards, and then they had 42 rushes, which was 58% of the offense with 140 yards. All right, so it was a good bad. I mean, look, it was sloppy towards the end. I ain't gonna lie, a lot of back and forth, nobody really capitalizing. But shout out to Missouri, they won 30. 23 was wrong on that pick there sometimes you are sometimes you're not right and that's just how it goes now next game i think i was wrong on uh on these last three but for the most part i was on point this week uh sometimes it's like that um sometimes not pick oh man losing the west uh losing the virginia dog Oh man, at home, man. I I did not think that they was gonna let these boys go in the pit, man, and beat them, man. I, I I swear, there's no way. This is like low key, like um, this is like West Virginia playing. Um, well, well, obviously they play each other, right? They're both in the ACC, right? But it's not it, the big of as big as a rivalry as West Virginia is, right? And and and, and it's crazy to say that. But it, but it just says right. But Virginia, um, you can't let that happen, bro. You can't let Virginia come in there and beat you, bro. You can't. You, you know what I'm saying? Because now you one and one with, you know what I'm saying? You let Virginia get you West Virginia. You beat them, but Virginia, like you, you can't. You can't let that happen. And I didn't think that it was going to happen. I really didn't. Um, because those those games are normally a lot more important. I mean, you you thought they look they it was a very balanced game from both teams, but I mean, look, Virginia, I think they they're a lot better than what their their um their record is, bro. Like, and it's crazy to say that because you can say your record say you are who your record says you are, right? Like, I don't think that you can really put that in, in like a lot of perspective in college football today, right? I I don't know, like I guess because. I thought that they were a, a well-rounded, a more well-rounded team than a lot of teams that they went up against, right? When I mean a well-rounded, like back and forth. And I, I've seen them play SMU, and they look really good versus SMU. I knew, um, despite of a lot of people being big on Eli Holston, he's a red shirt freshman. Um, he was 10 for 23 in the game, 111 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions, got sacked twice. Um and we we Desmond Reed, that's he, I mean, he had 16 carries, 80 yards. He really didn't get going the way he is. And he's also like usually the number one receiving target, too. Look, he had two catches, 43 yards, 16 carries, 80 yards. Like he does that both games. He's a dual threat running back. And 
they like he's the engine that gets Pittsburgh going. Not to say that they didn't get it, but that defense just couldn't get a stop. I mean, the, the defense that showed up for Syracuse just did not show up to the uh, against Virginia on Saturday. They just didn't show up at all. And Virginia, they didn't out. It's like they didn't out stat and just go crazy on them. I mean, for like, listen, that offense, it, it, Pitt, Pitt's offenses can't seem to get rolling outside of him. Like they gotta let Eli play his game or 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 open up some more of that offense. Get some, you know, what I'm saying, get some crossings going. Something, man. They, they gotta get some. That scheme has to. Get, they have to open up that scheme, man. Get some more crossing routes going, um, you know. Utilize the tight end a little bit more, man. They they got to get that offense rolling, man. More than just uh, hitting Desmond Reed on screens and and using him as the number one receiving target. There's receivers on Pitt at Pitt. There's a lot of receivers at the University of Pittsburgh. And why is Eli Holston not hitting him? I mean, he was ten for twenty three. That's the problem. That's the problem. 13 times out of 13 times he dropped back, he didn't hit. And he only got sacked two times, right? Not to say that they wasn't getting giving him pressure or whatever, but nobody really can get going. They try to get Nate Yarno in there. I mean, look, two in it, like for what? You know what I'm saying? He was four for 12. Man, had he had a touchdown, but he also had two interceptions. Like, bro. <sighs> It's crazy to say that because, look, Anthony uh, Calandrea, whatever his name is, the, the quarterback for Virginia, yo, he was 16 for 24, 127 yards in this game. He had one touchdown, two interceptions. We we sacked him six times, and somehow, like, they still win this game. So, I mean, like, but the defense, like, at times when they should have stopped, they didn't stop him. And, so I'm I don't want to say that they didn't show up like you know I'll take that that, that statement back and saying that they didn't show up all the way but we, they just didn't get the stops when we needed the stops but I get it I was on the field a lot of the game and that offense for Pitt just can't get going we got a quarterback problem in Pittsburgh um huge one to me I mean Eli Olsen is not consistent you missed 13 times you got receivers, man. That offense got to get rolling a little bit better, in my opinion, man. I don't know what's going on today, man. But anyhow, they had thirty-eight had thirty-eight passes, one hundred sixty-five yards, fifty-eight uh, percent of their offense. Um, they had twenty-eight rushes, forty-two percent of their offense for one hundred thirty-three yards. So fifty-eight forty-two was their uh, pass to run ratio. Uh, then you got a fifty-eight percent, forty-two percent rushing. Okay. Then uh, Virginia was also Virginia was on there. They were forty four percent passing, fifty six percent rushing, thirty one passes for one hundred and seventy yards, thirty nine uh, rushes for one hundred and eighty nine yards, and they got the dub over Pitt at home. Pitt at home, they were on the road. Virginia got the dub. Shout out to Virginia. We were right on this BYU game. Um, BYU got a win over a rivalry game, and they played Utah. I thought that they played this game with tremendous um, poise, man. Um, to, to, to see this team play the way they play, I know a lot of people out there run with the whole, oh, the Big 12, Ned, the Big 12 is trash this year. The Big 12 ain't this. Like, all right, it's not what we expected expected it to be, right? We we had a lot of teams we expected to be good, but these teams are still, and some of these teams are still playing. And I respect Utah because they're still playing hard. Utah is still playing hard. I think Oklahoma State might ha- might have given up, um, which I don't like because they still got to play Colorado, um, and that that's a big game for anybody right now, right? If you got Colorado on your schedule, the remaining schedule, you got a big game still. So huge game to show what you can do. So why act like you want to give up? I don't I don't get that. I I I don't get that. That that's corny to me, but here's what it is. But look, Utah, you know they both of these teams was gonna come out and they were both gonna try to run the ball and they're gonna pass the ball very balanced. So and then and it's and they did just that. They came out and they did that. They performed up, man. They did what they had to do. I think that um, they only won. With the, with the final score was twenty. 
two to 21 and BYU had to come back. Utah had that game and they kind of let it slip from them. But BYU has been down like that a couple of different times. I think it was to Oklahoma state also. And they also was able to come back and win. Um, both quarterback, well, well, Brandon Rose, you got to say, was, you know, coming in there early, young guy, you know, 12 for 21, 112 yards. He had one touchdown, one intercept, two touchdowns and one interception. I think that that was an okay game from him. Um, and being young and, and that big of a game coming in there like that, like you can't be mad at what he was able to do to go in there because they had the league for, the, you know what I'm saying? They had the league in the fourth. So you gotta go that defense letting it letting letting uh, BYU come back and BYU's been able to do that. Um, they had Jake Retzliff under control pretty much. I mean, they were able to get to him. They sacked him three times. He was 15 for 33 yards and 207 yard. 30. He was 15 for 33 with 207 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. He was sacked three times. The quarterback for BYU was. We know Utah can get to the quarterback. And that's why I think that it's going well. It's not that I, I don't think anything. I know that when Utah goes play Colorado up at when they play on my Folsom Field, this is going to be a good battle. It's going to be a it's going to be a very it's going to be a good battle to watch because we've seen that Colorado defense step up. Um, I don't think it's not foreign territory for Utah, but last season, um. You can argue that Utah got past Colorado with a slick one last year. They owe they owe Utah. They owe Utah one. This is low low key rivalry. They owe Utah one, man. Utah got over on them. They barely got them last year. Um, and Utah got a team that's going to come in and they're going to play hard. But I did take B. I took BYU to beat Utah, and they barely did it. Um. I don't know if Cam Rising would have made a V. I, I, I guess he makes the difference with his team, right? That much, that big of a difference um, to where you see a, a team like that and, and be so horrible. And, and, and it's the truth in college. Like, the run game matters tremendously in college football like crazy. But without a quarterback, your team, the team is, like, not going to be – it's gonna not going to be a good team. Like you got to have a quarterback that could come in and take care of the ball, make smart decisions, um, and yeah, and take care of the ball. You you got to have a quarterback to do that in college football because if you look around at college football and you see bad quarterback play, like statistically, um, you can look at the quarterback for uh, Allen Bowman for for Oklahoma State and say, oh, statistically. He got his stats look all right. Well, as far as passing yards and, and throwing the ball, but you look at how many interceptions that guy got, that's what makes his team horrible. How many times he has he turned the ball over and lost a game for Oklahoma State? A lot of times. A lot of times. Oklahoma State getting down early, not being able to run the ball. Um, They go from, you know, being one of the best offensive lines last season most of all that that mostly that whole team coming back this year and not being able to get the job done this year crazy crazy um the uh, Georgia Bulldogs they're almost the same way they're, they're almost their whole team came back from last year um a lot of guys came back from Georgia came back this year and they they already got two L's but I mean there's nowhere in there I'm not comparing Georgia to no damn Oklahoma State don't, don't let me get it twisted I'm just saying you look on college football how quick things can change and turn around. But Oklahoma State's team is just horrible because Alan Bowman just can't take care of the ball. He can't take care of the ball. That's how important it is for a quarter for you to have a quarterback in college football. You gotta have a quarterback. If you don't have a quarterback, you ain't got shit, man. Like, what do you got? What do you like for real? Like, I and I get it. Like, we, we, we see the running. We look around and you say, all right, well, they got running backs. Well, yeah, they got a running back, they can run a ball. But you gotta have a quarterback with that. If you like, and, and and vice versa, like, oh, cool, you can pass the ball all you need to. You got all receipt, but you gotta be able to run the ball. You got you. They it go together. It's this is a team sport. You got you. know what I'm saying, you got you can have a quarterback that can throw the ball like crazy, but you gotta have a 
I got to get four yards production per carry out of my running back. If I can't get four yards per carry out of my running back, I might not have a good season if my quarterback can throw it all over the yard. That's why you see, like right now, saying Colorado has success. They're getting at least four yards a carry, three or yard, four yards a carry, right? At least three, four, right? Somewhere in there. You got to be at three and a half. You can't be at 2.8 yards per carry. You got to be at above three, I would say, and be safe, right? I would say that because I'll take three. If you can give me three, three on first and three on second, I can deal with a three and five, third and four, third and five. You know what I'm saying? Or or, or maybe on first down, you get me five. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you know, I could take that. Right? You know, I do live with that. But like playing behind the sticks, you can't do that. And I'm saying that you're seeing the importance of it. You're seeing that the, the way that the game has changed all around. You got to have one. I mean, look, look at Michigan. Their record probably would be a lot better. Um, if they had a quarterback, they beat Indiana. You know what I mean? They're able to beat Indiana. They're able to beat a lot of teams if they have a quarterback. You know what I'm saying? They got better quarterback play. They're able to, you know, move the ball in in, in different ways. You know what I'm saying? They're able to move the ball in a different way. You're not able to try to pinpoint them down to one dimensional. And that's why you, you thought that uh, Utah would be a little bit more successful. They have the balance down. They just don't have a quarterback there. And when you don't have a quarterback, um, if, if they can get Rose to play better and Rose to show up ver versus this Colorado team, then maybe they, they got a fighting chance. But um, how how much is is, is the uh, offensive coordinator really going to put in this young quarterback's hand against a good defense like Colorado, right? So you got to say they get that game. Um, and then BYU, for instance, why is BYU they undefeated? Well, nobody. I didn't think that Drake uh, Jake Restless was going to get the job. I thought their quarterback was going to be trash. I thought their season was going to be trash. I didn't think they were going to be sitting at where they're sitting at right now doing what they're doing because they got a quarterback who takes care of the ball, makes smart decisions with the Rock, and as a result of that, you get a team that is undefeated and that is looking really, really good. Um, Same thing, like, say what you want about Washington State. They're sitting at 8-1 and one right now. The Washington State's sitting at 8-1, and one, and a lot of people say that they probably like how how do they work into the college football playoff? They're sitting at number 21 right now. They're at eight and one. And I don't look like they're taking their foot off the pedal to me. Don't look like that's happening anytime soon soon. Um Boise State barely beat Nevada. Um they got they just barely beat Nevada. Then you also got a UNLV. They still creeping up in there, seven and two, three and one in the Mountain West. Um Shout out to them. Notre Dame is just playing unreal football right now. Like, um, it's crazy to say this, but like Notre Dame, like ever since that loss, man, they just been on a tear, man. Um, they're gonna be tough to beat. Notre Dame is gonna be tough to beat and tough to pick against. They're going to be tough to beat. Uh, I don't want to say a team like Arizona State is bad because they're not bad. I think, I think Arizona State is. Is a, is a is a good football team. You got to say that about about because of their record, but or they're not they're not there yet. They're not there yet. They're not ready to compete outside of that. I don't think, to be honest, um, I, I don't really think any Big Twelve team is ready outside of the Big Twelve. But I could be wrong. But outside of the Big Twelve, I don't think that any of those teams are ready. But we'll see with some of these bowl game matchup matchups, and that's why I wish a lot of these players were playing these bowl games because then we'll actually get to see what they could do outside of these conferences, right? You know what I'm saying? Get get some good matchups going and see what's going on with that. Uh, TCU, they they look okay. They look okay, man. TCU look okay with Josh Hoover out there. Um, some games got away from them, I believe. Um, like, for instance, UCF game. Uh, Tennessee, man. Um, I don't think that Tennessee's immortal. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I do not think that Tennessee finishes off with, I think they lose another game. I think that maybe Georgia gets them. Um, they look all right, but I, I don't think that they are. I don't think that any SEC team is. Uh, Oregon and, um, and Maryland and Oregon, you got to give uh, Maryland their props, man, for playing Oregon the way that they did. Uh, that that game they played them really well, man. They they did they played Oregon really well. I think that Oregon also got a they got to come out fair and they got to they got a lot to prove. But I, I look, college football is college football. It's like the playoff system. I think that anyone whoever's going to make the twelve the top twelve teams, 
I think that any one of those teams, and I'm going to keep this a buck, any one of those teams besides the G5 team that gets in and Boise State, I think that can beat anybody. So I'll say the top 11, any one of them top 11 teams that gets in these college football playoffs will be able to win the national championship. That's, that's just the way I see college football right now. I don't think that anybody is the hands-down favorite to win the national championship this year, and I like that. I really like that about college football. Um, I really do. Clemson one week looking like they're they can they can do it, but you know they get held up in Virginia Tech and other and other places. You think Colorado could do it at one point? Then you see a flaw in Colorado and and and, and what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? And that that's what every team in college football you just could see like anybody can be beat anybody can at any given any given week at any given time army struggling with north texas the way that they did um some people even got them saying that they can upset notre dame but struggling with a north texas like it was week in and week out kansas uh kansas shouldn't just put in a shellac on iowa state and i took iowa state to win the big 12 but right now colorado crap up in there Help with the help of Kansas, you know, Kansas playing out of their mind right now. And they're saying, okay, well, at least, at least we could get to a bowl game. You know what I'm saying? At least we can get to a bowl game. And I like to fight in them. Um, man, it's just it's crazy football, man. All we got uh, UConn being seven and three right now. Like, who would have thought that UConn football team being seven and three right now? Like L- Liberty with two losses right now. Uh man, crazy. It's, it's a it's a year. Rutgers beat in Minnesota. Yeah. All right, man. What we're seeing this year is great in college football, man. It's a it's a great season, great time to be a huge fan of college football. But um, been kicking it for a minute right now, man. Whole hour and a half. Appreciate y'all up out there, man. Y'all tune in. Peace. Where we at? Where we at?